scripture with you. Um, this is the scripture we were actually studying this week in the youth. It's in Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read uh, about four verses, five verses to you. Starting in verse 1, Paul says, If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then jumping down to verse 11, here's how he closes this section. He says, Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
And I think as we've been walking through this series with Pastor Greg about how important church is and, and what our focus should be, like that just really sat with me this week and challenged me this week of when we come to this building and we learn about church and the importance of church and why we're here, what is our focus while we're in this room? Is it on the things of this world and the distractions and the fears and the anxieties? Or is it on the things that are above, the hope and the love of Jesus Christ? And so I just want to challenge you this morning, um, and I'm praying this morning that as we sit here and we hear Brother Greg continue on, that we would be challenged to focus on what's in this room and what we're talking about, the truth of Scripture and not everything else that's going on around us, but that our focus could be centered on Christ. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, uh, Father, and the rain that you've given us, Father, uh, just a little bit of cooling off with all this heat that we've had. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would be present in this space today, that your Holy Spirit would be active um, and moving through our hearts and our lives, that you would continue to be um, with the worship as, as we continue to worship, Father, and then also Pastor Greg as he brings the word to us. Father, I just pray that our focus would be only on you that you could remove all the distractions from our hearts and our minds for this next hour, Father, that our focus could be on you and what you have for our life. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Just be with us today, Lord. Bless Brother Greg, Lord. Give him a special anointing, Lord, to preach your word, Lord. And just let us be able to comprehend everything he's trying to teach us, Lord. Be with the ones that can't be here for illnesses, Lord. Touch the Amorite family, Ronnie Slee, and the rest of them, Lord. Just be with them, Lord. We love you and we magnify this, this day for you, Lord. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Give Brother Greg the words we need to hear. Hide him behind the cross, Lord. We pray for a moment, Lord, that you would touch her. Bring her back into her health, Father. We just ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 2 one more time. And it will be uh, kind of the end of this, unless something changes, might be the end of this little series on the church. I told Chelsea before we started this morning, I, I said, now Mona's not doing this, so it's up to you to get them smiling and happy. So how did she do? Look at me. There you go. Thank you, Chelsea, for doing that. Thank you, uh, Beverly, thank you, Sister Beverly, for filling in for Teresa. Uh, I'm a little worried about my mind anymore. I cannot remember names at all. But uh, I do appreciate Beverly stepping up and, and doing that. Uh, it takes all of us. It takes all of us to make the church. It takes all of us individuals to create this body of Christ. And, and we read this passage of Scripture last week. And uh, today's title is How to Become Connected with the Local Church. How to Become Connected with the Local Church. I think it's a great title. I think it's a great question. And, and the answers are found in Acts chapter 2. We're just going to begin reading where we did last week just to refresh our minds and our memories of what has been written here. In verse 40 it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If we could start the message off today with a statement, I, I think the statement would be something like this. There is a lot going on in the world in which we live today. There, there is so much going on. Matter of fact, if you just pause for a moment and just look around and see all that's going on, we realize we are bombarded on every side. We are dealing with a multitude of problems. We are dealing with a multitude of troubles. We are dealing with a multitude of heartaches. Matter of fact, we are still, Josh and I were talking a little bit about this this week in the office, and, and uh, I kind of like what he said, that we're still dealing with the pandemic, but the truth of it is, it's here and it's not going anywhere. Pretty good observation. When we're dealing with this COVID pandemic, do we, we wonder, do we take the shot? Do we not take the shot? Do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? You see, it's like that topic is never going to end. And I'll be honest with you, I'm tired of it. And Lord, help us. Help us today when it comes to the politics we're dealing with. We really, we really have no clue who we can trust anymore. We, we turn on the television, we, we listen to podcasts, we listen to the radio. You, it doesn't matter, it, it's all jaded, it's all lopsided or one-sided. And, and then you, like me, I'm, I'm consumed and hooked on TikTok. 
And I got to hear a preacher do a 30 second little whatever it was. And, and Mona gets mad at me when I reply to these things. She said, they're going to find you and kill you. <laughs> but one guy gets on there and he just bashing and just getting after it. And, and I, I just put on there, where in your message is anything about the redemptive work of Christ? And in about a half a day, I had a thousand likes. I wish those people would come to church and they might like me. <clears throat> but let me say this to you today. I, I don't want to talk about what's going on in the White House. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is what's going on in your house. You see, the first Christians were revolutionaries. That group of people that was formed in those days in many ways is so different from what we know as the church today. According to the book of Acts, they met in their homes and they devoted themselves to God and to God's word. That's what they did. They met in their homes because they were devoted to God and they were devoted to God's word. Think about that for a moment. We, we're talking about getting connected in the local church. I, I promise you this, without getting ahead of the sermon, I'm going to make you a promise. If we could spend as much time in God's Word in our homes privately, we would be amazed at what God could do for us publicly here at the church. Amen. It's us finding ourselves being devoted to God and devoted to His Word. They met in their homes. And because of the results... The early Christians brought about the most amazing and most powerful transformation the world has ever seen or has ever known. I mean, think about it for a minute. Those Christians back then, they were emerged in the midst of probably some of the most diverse Roman melting pot they've ever had before. It was a collection of people with social and religious ideas that ranged from A to Z. And through purely peaceful means, they completely changed the empire and united it under the banner of Christianity. And they did it. When you read in there, it says that they added to the church daily. They did that without one megachurch. They did that without one televised program. They did that without Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever else we're using today. They simply opened up their homes. They opened up their homes and they spoke the truth fearlessly and trusted God for the results. Long before Christianity became a dominant political power, it was nothing but a divine movement of God. Long before Christianity found its comfortable home inside four walls of a church building, it was nothing but an active body of passionate believers. But what did the early church have that we may be missing today? Have you ever just kind of wondered? You, you read Acts chapter 2 and there's a bunch of people being redeemed. There's a bunch of people being saved. There's a bunch of people being added to the church daily. What did they have that maybe we're missing? I think if we were to look at it, we would realize that they were bonded with a they were bonded and united by a common truth. You see, the early Christians, they were a movement of people, a movement of people that recognized and committed themselves to an important objective truth or claim, which was this, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And that through Jesus Christ and only Christ, were they able to have a personal relationship with God the Father, the creator of the universe. You see, this common truth and this relationship to Christ became the unifying force behind the very movement of God. Second of all, they were characterized by an uncommon joy. In the midst of their terrible persecution and hardships, it was these believers that were able to stay focused upon God instead of their own situation. In other words, instead of crying in your own milk, they cried to God. There's a difference. There's a difference in a pity party and praising God. 
Matter of fact, one of the things I read this week, I was, I was intrigued by what it said about the church. And one writer that I was reading about, he, he's, a, he's famous, he's got all the books, he's got the mega church. And, and here's what he said. He said, we as a church must stop pandering to those who really just don't care about the church. Yes. Isn't that what we do? We, if someone, someone comes to church and, and they get a little upset, they get a little sideways, and we want the preacher to go beg them to come back to church. And when we beg them to come back to church, lo and behold, they show back up and then something else happens and the preacher's back over there begging them again to come back to church. And what the guy was saying is, we got to stop doing that. We need to start looking for the people that want to come to God's house instead of the people that just want to complain about God's house. They were characterized by an uncommon joy. In the midst of all of their persecution and hardships, they were focused upon God. And as a result, regardless of their personal circumstances, they were able to live with joy. So how do we today, we've preached these last few weeks on the church, how do we today get connected? See, everything I'm reading about today and, and the progress and the movement of the church, it's really talking and teaching and preaching about churches getting connected. So how do we get connected to the church like they do? <coughs> I think before we can answer that question or try to answer that question, we need to look at a meaning or the definition of a couple of words. And I think the first word we need to look at is that word connected. We're talking about getting connected in the local church, but what does connected mean? I'm glad you asked because I looked it up. Here's what it is. Connected means linked. It means related. It means joined or attached or united or together. You see, that's what being connected is. It means we are together. The other word I think we ought to look at is the word realize. I know you think those two don't go together, but realize the definition or the meaning of realize is understand. So if we're talking about getting connected to the local church, we need to realize or we need to understand or we need to comprehend or we need to appreciate or we need to grasp or we need to just recognize what the church really is. So how do we become connected? I think to become connected, I, I believe we may want to realize a few things. You see the two words going together now? Connected, realize. I think the first thing we ought to realize today is we need to realize that the church is important. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, the important word means here, and, and when we say the word important, it means vital or imperative or essential or it's crucial. The church today is essential. The church today is vital. The church today is important. Now think about that passage of Scripture for a minute, because I'm sure if you've been to church very long, you've heard that passage of Scripture. And you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Many times when we hear that passage of Scripture, our mind instantly goes to that place of fire, brimstone, and torment. Am I not right? When we hear that passage of Scripture, and Jesus says to Peter, On this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We think of fire, we think of brimstone, we think of torment. But the Greek word here from this passage simply means the dark world. In other words, we draw from this passage of Scripture is this, when that word means the unseen or the dark things. Here's what we draw from it. That there is nothing in this world, seen or unseen, that will ever destroy the church. One man told me one time these words. I will never forget it. Standing at back door, just like that. He said to me that this church will never survive without me. I'm going to promise you this. Every church and I mean every church, will do disgustingly well without any of us. Why is that? 
because the church is important to God. Second of all, we need to realize that the church is imperfect. The church is imperfect. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, we are a group of people that make up the church. It's not in the building. It's not in the name. It's not in the denomination. And since we are a group of people that by our nature, we are sinners, then we need to realize this. We are a faction of people that make mistakes. We are a faction of people that say the wrong words. And the reason why I have wrote that down and inserted that here in this part of the message is this. Many times we allow something that someone says to us hinder how we come to church. We do. I've seen people on fire for God that get in the church and get heavily involved and then somebody says something and it quenches that fire. I'm going to ask y'all something. Why do you allow what someone says to quench your fire? They're just a sinner saved by grace like you. But we do. We'll put it in part and say, well, I'm done. I'm done. We're a faction of people that makes mistakes. We're a faction of people that say the wrong words. We are a faction of people that make the wrong choices. And folks, let's just be honest, sometimes we do the wrong thing. But praise be unto God, He loves the church. But we also need to realize that the church is influential. The church is filled with a body of believers. It is the greatest influence on the face of the earth. It is the one institution that offers spiritual healing to the hurting, to the bleeding, and to the lost. The church is nothing but an emblem of hope. It provides resources to meet the needs for a hungry soul. It gives guidance to the confused and direction for eternity. The church is the one place where we can come and feel like somebody regardless of what we've done. At church, we will hear a song that will lift our spirits. It lifts our burdens. At church, we'll hear a preacher's word preached that possibly could turn our lives around. There at church, we will hear about a Savior that can take nothing and make something out of it. No matter how bad we have been, no matter how low we think we are, we can never be bad enough or low enough that God won't save us. You see, the church is alive and well today. The church is important. And yes, the church can make a difference in a person's heart and life. For after all, if you will let it, the church can influence how you raise your children. Do you realize that? The church can influence how you raise your children. Anybody else the guinea pig growing up in church? Anybody else was the example growing up in church? If you don't know what I mean, let me tell you what I mean by that. And it influenced how I raised my kids. Let's try this. Did you ever have a kid do this in church? While the other kid was doing this? <laughs> yeah. I'm doing this. Because there was a rule. Don't run in church. And there goes Kevin. And I'm just walking. My daddy grabbed me by the arm and wore my hind end out and said laugh so that Marcia Gable could hear. I said no running in church. Y'all want to know what happened to my kids? I said no running in church. I'm telling y'all, the church can influence how we raise our children. I got news for you. I'd rather the church influence my kids than something out in that world. They 
got enough of the world offering them everything. We need to be a church that's connected together, that's helping influence raise how we raise our children. But here's another deal. The church can influence how we approach our marriages. Folks, we're going into marriages today, and, and I look around, most of y'all are getting up there in years, and we're probably just preaching to the choir here. But I'm going to tell you, the church, the church helped us. I'm not talking about, I'm just telling you, it influenced, it has influenced our marriage. It's made a difference in our marriage. But let me give you one more thing. It influences how we live our lives. Bottom line, the church will influence how we live our lives. But the question is still lingering. How do we become connected? You see, the preacher has said all of this stuff as an introduction to get us to where we're at now. How do we become connected in the local church? I'd like to end the message with a little thought. I realized for three or four weeks we preached on the church. But if I could pause just for a moment and ask you this question, I'd like for you to try to answer it the best you can. If you could pursue one thing in life, what would it be? One thing. I wonder today, do we pursue power? Do we pursue positions? Do we pursue prestige? Maybe we're pursuing popularity. Maybe we're just pursuing a life of liberty and luxuries. <clears throat> but let me ask you something. What do we pursue? And if we could pursue one thing, what would it be? I really think out of all the things, and, and it makes my wife so mad. But out of all of the things that I pursue, I probably pursue golf more than anything. I mean, I just, I, I know that for you that don't play golf, you don't understand, but, but I'm telling you, there is no greater joy than to go to a golf course because there's nothing else I do in life. Nothing else I do in life where I can get it with a group of people and hit a little white ball. It's just sitting there. And you hit it, and all at once you hear five or six people say these words. Good shot. Good job. Way to go, Greg. Boy, you did good on that one. Now do you see why I pursue it? Because I like the affirmation I get from golf. And I will go out in the yard and I chip golf balls, I hit golf balls. I go out here, I, 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 I wish Harlan would mow me a green out here so I could chip them at it. Put a flag in the ground. Folks, I'm telling you, I, it would be nothing to spend two or three hours a day just hitting golf balls. But I wonder, what if I was to pursue God that way? Let me say this. Spirituality is completely based upon relationships. So let's be honest, if we're going to find ourselves connected with the church, then we're going to have to find ourselves in a relationship with God. It was the Apostle Paul that went through a lot for the cause of Christ. He faced death. He received 40 stripes minus one five times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned one time. He was shipwrecked three times. He spent a day and a night in the midst of the sea. He had been robbed and on many occasions found himself cold and hungry. He was given a thorn in the flesh. Nobody knows what that was, but he was given. He was abandoned by all of his friends, and through all of that, he wrote 14 books of the Bible. But through all of that, while sitting in a jail cell, he writes probably some of the most important words he ever wrote. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says that I may know him. You see, relationship with God is all that really mattered to Paul. And for us today, the key to finding ourselves connected to the church, that's it. 
It's having a personal relationship with God. I'm going to take you to one more passage of Scripture to kind of summarize what I mean, and it, it's important. It's a powerful passage of Scripture. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak and the weary. It, it, it's a strong passage of Scripture. And here it is. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone. Well, let me give you the setting, okay? It's judgment. Y'all say judgment. Judgment. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but there's coming a day where every one of us will stand before God and give an account of our lives. We will be judged, right? So let's try that one more time. Judgment. Now listen to these words. Jesus said, this is the red letters. These are the words of Christ. He says, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter God's kingdom. The only people who will enter are those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that last day, many will call me Lord. They will say, Lord, Lord, by the power of your name we speak for God. And by your name we forced out demons and did many miracles. Then I will tell those people clearly, get away from me, you people who do wrong. I never knew you. Hang on, hang on, preacher. I'm faithful to God's house. Hang on, preacher, I, I'm, I'm giving a little tithe here and a little tithe there. If you're giving a little tithe here and a little tithe there, you're not tithing, you're tipping. There's my tithing little gouge yeah, right there. Well, hang on a second, preacher, I, I taught Bible study class. Hang on, preacher, I, I had small groups in my home. Hang on, preacher, I, I did a lot of great things for the church. I did a lot of great things for the kingdom of God. But Christ is saying here, get away from me who do wrong. I never knew you. Interesting word there, knew. If you take the writing of Greek and, and relay it back to the Hebrew writing, the word knew there is the same meaning of when it said Abraham knew Sarah. So to keep it rated G, y'all kind of understand what we're talking about. Intimacy. And we know what intimacy is. It's closeness. So I said all of this in the last few weeks to kind of get us to the end here. And here it is at the end. We will never get connected to the church until we are intimate with God. Bottom line. Until we find ourselves in an intimate, close, right. Let's stop there for a minute. Right relationship with God. Folks, we cannot live like the devil all week and expect to serve God and be connected with God on Sundays. Amen. So that means for us to be intimate with God, to be able to get connected in the local church, we're going to have to be intimate with God. And to be intimate with God means that we're going to have to be right with God. Hang on, preacher. You're judging me. No, I'm not judging you. It is between you and God that you need to ask yourself, is thy heart right with God? Now let's take it a step farther. If we're going to get connected to church, in the local church, that means we're going to have to find ourselves right with God and in a real relationship with God. Folks, what we are doing is real. As we said two weeks ago, going to church for mere attendance, those days are over. People are going to go to church today because they have a right, real relationship with Him. You show me a group of people that is beyond no doubt right with God, living in a real relationship with God, and I'll show you a group of people meeting together that are connected. Because after all, folks, if we remove God from this scene, what do we have? Just a bunch of individuals with opinions and ideas. But when you put God into this, we now have something to focus upon. We have something to live for. And something to dream about. And my dream is someday to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Enter thou in for the joys of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to the end.
I know it comes across as we are doubting anyone's relationship with you. It's not that we're doubting any of it. It's just a simple question. And only we know the answer for ourselves. Is our heart right with you? Maybe the joy, the zeal, and the passion for this place has left our lives. Maybe it's because we're just not as close to you as we once was. We have allowed circumstances of life to cool our fire. We have allowed the attitude of a person to cool our iron. Where out of all of this do we stand with you, God? I like that hymn of old. Is thy heart right with God? Lord, let us today be willing to ask ourselves that question and answer it honestly. Are we right with you? Because, Lord, if there is something coming between you and us, let this be the day that we make things right. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us, please, this morning? As Sister Beverly plays this verse of invitation, we're talking about the importance of the church. The church is going to survive with us or without us. But are we going to be one that gets connected in the church? In other words, are we going to be one that gets involved in the church? Are we going to become a person that's part of the church? We need to make sure we're right with God. When we find ourselves right with God, we will have a passion to serve God. We will find ourselves having a desire to serve God. The early church, they they had a desire and a passion to serve God. Because of that, they were connected and the church was being added to daily. I don't know about you, but I want to get connected. I want God to do mighty, miraculous things. But maybe it needs to start with us right here, right now. Maybe that ought to be our prayer. God, start right here with me.